So I thought that I would, um, this is essentially science, but I think that because of the audience and because of the interests and the importance of think, what we're going to talk about, I'd like to frame this as a, as a kind of the, the full public health issue. Um, lots of times we do science and lots of times it's transitional or translational, I think people call it, um, and has real world implications for public health policy. I think the topic that I'm going to be talking about today is squarely in this um, location. So why would anybody worry about the uh, effects of pesticides on human health? Well, there's a lot of good reasons. First of all, we have a lot of new chemicals that are introduced each year. Um, many of them are synthetics now. Um, the Environmental Protection Agency estimates that a fair proportion of these chemicals, which have certainly not been vetted, are potentially neurotoxic. We know that the developing brain is highly vulnerable, and many of these substances do cross the placenta. So they could reach the fetus during prenatal period. We have good experimental evidence, and many of the folks in this room um, could, could speak about this knowledgeably, suggesting that there are adverse effects of many chemicals on growth and development. And finally, and particularly in the case of the organophosphate pesticide, which I'm going to talk about today, chlorpyrifos, many pesticides have been used or are available um, as nerve gas um, in warfare. Um, they were specifically designed to attack the mammalian nervous system. It always has been amazing to me that people would then wonder why um, these pesticides were potentially dangerous for kids. So this was then, 1945, Jones Beach, um, a little before my time, but not that much. And um, as you can see, this is a DDT truck cruising down um, the beach, and there are little children playing. Um, nobody was concerned about this at the time. Um, people were worried a lot more about mosquitoes. This is now, and this is in the United States. This is just a crop dusting plain. Um, as we know, things that are sprayed in agricultural communities and in the environment do drift. Uh, and I, there are many facts one could say about having found evidence of certain pesticides in um, the hard packed snow in all the national parks in the United States. So we know that it does drift. And this scene is commonplace in many parts of the world. So even though perhaps in the United States the applicators are not as closely involved with the pesticides, they may or may not be in certain agricultural communities, but I think that this is, uh, this is quite commonplace. So I'm going to do a quick overview and uh, go through just eight quick points, and the, the rest of the talk will follow these points. First, I'm just going to talk a little bit about identifying the exposure. I'll talk a bit about the formulation of the hypotheses so you'll know why we did the study, how we did the study, our choice of study design, a little bit about the neuropsychological assessment, um, which is really just how we assessed um, how the kids did um, prospectively in this longitudinal study, some demonstration about our findings, how we were able to identify distinct profiles of children, which is really a way of saying these were the effects of high exposure to this particular pesticide. Um, looking at some associations between the exposure itself and the profile, and finally mapping to some alterations in brain structure and function. And there's actually uh, the finale then will be to circle back around to talk about some of the um, public health policy implications and maybe tell a little bit of a story about the regulatory activity in this country. So let's start with what is chlorpyrifos. It's a broadband um, organophosphate insecticide. Uh, it's been widely used uh, since the 1960s. It was banned for indoor residential use uh, in 2000 and 2001, and I'll say a little bit more about that later. Uh, it is still being used uh, in many applications in the United States and worldwide. The applications are agricultural primarily, although um, it is sprayed on lawns, golf courses, medians, 
Christmas tree farms, um, spray it on cedar posts to keep away the insects, and lots of things that you come in contact with. Uh, the application is, is quite prevalent. Um, the other reason and the final reason maybe why we selected to study this is there were um, biomarkers and the availability of air monitoring so that we could have some pretty good um, estimates of exposure dose. So just a quick word about mechanism, and there are many folks in the room I'm sure who could talk uh, very knowledgeably about this. But prenatal um, exposure to chlorpyrifos is thought to inhibit acetylcholinesterase. And um, the toxicity then results from the inhibition of cholinesterase and the consequent cholinergic hyperstimulation. The important point here is that is just one mechanism. The animal uh, experimental literature suggests that chlorpyrifos also alters brain development via another pathway, which is potentially non-cholinergic. <laughs> and more importantly, that that particular exposure and the consequences of that exposure might occur at lower doses. Now, the implications of this are important for regulation. Because regulation, the Environmental Protection Agency does risk assessment and makes their risk assessment um, hopefully match the scientific evidence, but they are looking for safety levels. So if they're looking at a, uh, a level that is, uh, goes along with cholinesterase inhibition, uh, they may suggest that a pesticide um, is safe at that level. If there are other pathways that have any kind of mechanism operating below that threshold, then they've actually missed the mark. And I think that's what the bottom line is here, and we, we need to to really end up and talk a little bit about that with respect to regulation. The rest of the slide obviously makes the point that what goes on during the prenatal and the immediate postnatal period is very complicated and very important in the brain. There are a lot of critical processes. Um, some may or may not be irreversible. So the second major point, what are the hypotheses? Well, we came at it from two angles. We wanted to talk about um, performance on certain uh, neuropsychological indicators with potential clinical implications. And we wanted to also take a look at the brain itself and see if, in our case, we use five different modalities. But we were interested particularly in looking at brain size, both overall and regionally. And we had particular hypotheses based on what was seen in the animal work. So just a few words about our actual population. The Columbia cohort, as Irva mentioned, um, the Children's Center for Environmental Health started in 1997-1998, uh, and that's when we began recruitment. I highlighted those dates because the actual dates of recruitment, although we're still following the children uh, who are now reaching 15 years of age, occurred between 1998 and 2006. Right in the middle of that period, EPA banned chlorpyrifos for indoor residential use. So we have a natural experiment. We were collecting cord blood levels on our pregnant women throughout this period, and we had an opportunity to see what the effect of the ban was. So this is a cohort in northern Manhattan, primarily um, low-income minority, African-American and Dominican women. Um, and I will show you in a moment, they tend to be reasonably socially disadvantaged. We eliminated active smoking, which has um, well-known you know, birth consequences, and thought that that was a, a confounder that we perhaps didn't need, um, and, and certain uh, other uh, more serious illnesses. Currently, we followed the children uh, till about 14 years of age. So we looked at measures of the environment, uh, we had a biomarker, a blood-based measure of the parent compound, and we had particular outcomes. I should say that this is embedded in a much larger study. So the Children's Center for Environmental Health looked at a whole range of air pollutants, including polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, um, environmental tobacco smoke, and a slew of additional pesticides, heavy metals, uh, so we have a lot of um, information about exposure on this cohort. The demographics, as I mentioned, are 
pretty uh, low income, uh, minority, uh, a lot of um, families who had uh, not very high levels of education, um, a lot of single marital status, and uh, many of the families reported um, having either been homeless for a period of time or gone without basic necessities. The map on the right is actually a traffic map, but it happens to have dots where all the um, families lived. So we started out with 725 families, and this is a sort of a map of, of um, northern Manhattan and the South Bronx. Now, why would we bother studying uh, an urban population when we're talking about pesticides? Well, it turns out that the exposure from indoor residential use when we started the study is extremely high, um, and amazingly high. In 70% of the umbilical cord blood samples, we found evidence of chlorpyrifos. The air samples were even higher. Um, and in fact, the amount of insecticide that we learned was applied or used in New York City was greater than the amount of insecticide that we, was used throughout the rest of the state for agricultural purposes. So um, for those of you who, I don't know if this is a problem um, in this part of California, but there are a lot of cockroaches in New York City. They're pretty ubiquitous and they're pretty hard to deal with. Uh, and because of some associations between um, cockroach antigens and allergies, asthma, and a whole variety of things, it's probably best to get rid of them. Chlorpyrifos turns out to be a very effective insecticide. The levels of use, um, the final point in the indoor residential environment were very comparable to levels that were found in the Salinas Valley, um, Berkeley, uh, a group of researchers at Berkeley uh, looked at the levels in um, urinary metabolites uh, in the migrant farm workers and found very comparable levels. So it was widespread in New York City. These again are maps of New York City, the <coughs> darkest or the brightest areas. The left, the percent of households reporting pests. And although many of you may not be familiar with a, with a map of Manhattan, um, those are the areas where our families live. Also, not surprisingly, low-income areas in the city. And on, on uh, your right, uh, the percent of households using sprays, bombs, or foggers, which were considered the most toxic forms of um, pesticide application uh, in the apartments and the homes, were again, not surprisingly, um, highest in those parts of the city. So over the course of the next 12 to 14 years, we followed this cohort in many different ways. There were many spin-off, projects where people were looking at body weight, uh, asthma outcomes, respiratory health, and the like. I'm going to focus entirely here on the neurodevelopmental outcomes. And um, just to sort of show you that we did a lot of direct contact in the early years, we used the Bailey Scales of Infant Development. Families came in um, and generously uh, gave their time uh, to this assessment. We compensated um, with volunteer payments very generously and paid for transportation. It's a big imposition, I think, for families to participate in, in this type of work, and our families were terrific. Our retention rates have been quite high. Over the first couple of years, typically in a prospective longitudinal study, you do lose people due to moving, and people lose interest in the study. After about the age of four or five, we have barely lost anybody. And I think we've had such uh, good um, research assistants and people who've stuck with the study, everybody um, who was going out in the field and into the homes and collecting data was also bilingual. So in many ways, we made it as easy as possible for the families. Quick summary of the results through seven years of age. Um, we initially found a, um, a decrement in birth weight associated with high chlorpyrifos exposure. Um, Robin Wyatt published that paper. The deficit of 150 grams is, if you think about um, active smoking in pregnancy, is associated with approximately 200 gram deficit in birth weight. So this is not trivial. Um, it, it's, a, it's something that I think is an important clinically meaningful. Uh, thing to address. We found at three years of age um, some cognitive deficits, both in motor behavior and um, the cognitive measures. And I also put a highlight on the pervasive developmental disorders. 
Um, the instruments that we use at the age of three um, were not very sophisticated in this regard. Uh, it was a part of the, um, the Bailey scales of infant development and the child behavior checklist. Um, but it's highlighted here because this is a crowd that knows a great deal about autism and um, a PDD is on the spectrum. So we are much too small a cohort to be following out to determine if we have very many cases of autism. We have a couple, but it's not going to be something we can put to a test to determine if we have links between chlorpyrifos exposure and the spectrum. The seven-year outcomes, I'm going to say just briefly, we looked primarily at cognition um, using the WISC, the Wexler. Um, infant scales of development, and um, there are subscales. We found the strongest effects in working memory uh, and full scale IQ. Now, right about this time, well, I'll say one more thing about this, I guess, before I go to the, the papers. This is a, a, a spline function. It will just show you, if you look at the green line, which is the working memory line. Um, and along the x-axis is the uh, chlorpyrifos exposure level in picograms per gram. You will see along the green line that the, the gradual, modest decrement starts right from the beginning. I think this is an interesting thing to show, um, mostly because it suggests that there isn't a threshold. And with some heavy metals that we have you know, studied for a long time now, for example, lead, I think most people would say unsafe at any level. So with respect to chlorpyrifos, we know that there does not appear to be, at least with respect to cognition, any kind of a meaningful threshold. Now right about this time, a remarkable thing happened. We were about to publish this paper and just coincidentally found that the Berkeley group was about to publish a paper, and lo and behold, it was also their seven-year findings, and lo and behold, they had the same instrument. And then the group at Mount Sinai, also an urban sample, was about to publish a paper. And this coincidence um, was, was a true coincidence. The journal, Environmental Health Perspectives, um, picked up on this and said, well, let's publish them all in this journal, um, because as a package, this is a pretty interesting story. It's an interesting story for the following reason. All three papers reported significant seven-year effects. The studies used three different populations. Two were inner city and one was a rural agricultural population. And I think the third point is that the study used different biomarkers of exposure. So in the world of the two, uh, the Sinai study and the Berkeley study used urinary metabolites and we have a, a, a blood measure. The, the thing that's important about this, in this is not the kind of um, topic where people are going to study using a randomized clinical trial. So um, confirmation of observational studies in the world of epidemiology is difficult. You're looking for causal associations, and sometimes rep replicability is a very good way to, to find that. So this was a convergent finding and I think um, worth giving credit to the other two studies who basically found the same thing that we found. Now I'm gonna just um, quickly go over, this, this is the section that talks about um, what types of outcomes we, we administered at 11 to 12 years of age. This was a much more comprehensive four-hour neuropsych battery, uh, which included, for those of you who are familiar with neuropsych testing, um, continuous performance tests, the NEPSI, the children's memory scales. A lot of these are direct performance measures. We got away from parental report. So we had a pretty good idea um, over a whole range of tests um, how these kids were performing. We threw it all into a factor analysis, many items, and came out with, um, with eight dimensions or domains, which those who are more um, conversant in the neuropsych literature than I am, found that they were very meaningful domains. And using these domains, we did a cluster analysis. What we were trying to do was take the community sample, 
don't forget, these are not clinical cases of anything. This is a community, a representative community sample. And we were trying to see if you cluster these children into different profiles, how does it fall out? Do you have heterogeneity in terms of the neuropsychological picture? And do we have distinct subgroups? So the answer is yes. We saw one group of children, the largest group of children, who are completely normal. They had relatively normal cognition, average IQ scores, no obvious deficits. Interestingly, very few of these children had been exposed to chlorpyrifos. The yellow group, cluster number two, had unusually high proportion of children had high levels of chlorpyrifos. And these kids looked a little different. They had average visual and verbal memory skills, good inhib inhibitory control. They were not ADHD type kids. They were not impulsive. Um, but they had surprisingly low full scale IQ, very poor auditory attention, and extremely weak fine motor skills. The third group that emerged, again, and this is in the general community sample, are the impulsive ADHD type kids that would normally occur. Again, very low exposure to chlorpyrifos, primarily black males, um, a lot of impulsive behavior. And this is just a behavioral type um, that in the continuum of behaviors um, would exist. So this is really what it looks like. Uh, the red line on the graph are the high chlorpyrifos exposed kids. And you can see, even if your area is not um, these neuropsych domains of memory and sustained attention and impulse control, you can see the areas where the children in the high chlorpyrifos group um, were very low. The most important area, which we actually were not expecting, um, was this manual dexterity, finger dexterity issue. These kids had real issues there, and we were very surprised to find that, although that we should have known, perhaps some of the, um, the rodent literature had suggested motor problems, but, but nevertheless, it came as a bit of a surprise. They, these children um, had problems attending. They were not impulsive but they had serious problems um, doing tasks that were not very difficult. They could do numbers backwards pretty well, numbers forward, they just got bored and they couldn't do it. So the final step uh, in, in the study to this point was to take a look at the um, potential brain implications of these behaviors. Mapping to alterations in brain structure and function is often difficult. It's not a perfect fit. Um, the brain is an amazing organ and quite compensatory. So we weren't at all sure what we would see in the brain that was reflecting any of the behavioral deficits. So we did a pilot study. Uh, we did it including children who were approximately between the ages of 6 and 11 in the same cohort. We picked a group with very high chlorpyrifos exposure and um, no other exposures either to the aromatic hydrocarbons or secondhand smoke or other exposures that we knew about or had measured. And we compared them to a group of children who had um, no exposure to anything negative that we could identify. Preliminary um, results showed that there were alterations in regions of the brain that subserve attention and executive function specifically, and I'll go through about four different findings here and um, show some imaging which illustrates the portions of the brain. Overall, the bottom line was the overall brain size did not differ significantly by exposure level, um, but there were volumetric differences in certain regions of the brain, um, both inward uh, deformations and outward deformations. The enlargements at the cerebral surface derived primarily from the underlying white matter changes. So just to run you through, and I, I know this is an extremely sophisticated group of people looking at uh, imaging results, but I just want to mention for the rest of you that along the right-hand side of the slide is sort of the legend, which shows how significant the findings are. To put it very simply, we're comparing 
two templates. We're comparing an average brain of the highly exposed children to an average brain of the low exposed children. And we're determining in what places they're different. So you have the warm colors where you have a, uh, a positive association and the cool colors where you have uh, an inverse association. So this is what we found, and this is what was summarized on the previous slide. In the highly exposed children, there were uh, bilateral enlargements in the following areas. The superior temporal gyri, the posterior middle temporal gyri, and the inferior postcentral gyri. And these were bilateral changes. Secondly, we found unilateral changes in the brain. And keep in mind, this is all anatomical, all structural. In the supermarginal gyrus, the superior frontal gyrus, the gyrus rectus, the cuneus, and the precuneus in the mesial views. And this was all in the right hemisphere. And finally, we showed the highly exposed kids showed inward uh, deformations in the dorsal and mesial surfaces of the left superior frontal gyrus. The correlations of the local surface measures, this is another way of looking at that finding uh, in the high exposure, tr high exposure group. The log transformed levels um, of chlorpyrifos are plotted on the x-axis. I think it's easiest to look at the scatter plot. The surface distances um, are plotted on the y-axis. The warm colors, as I mentioned, indicate positive correlations, and the cool colors indicate inverse correlations between chlorpyrifos and the surface measures. So this actually shows the enlarged surfaces along the superior frontal gyrus with increasing exposure to chlorpyrifos. So this is as close as you'll get in a small sample to dose response effect. In the high chlorpyrifos group, there is a significant dose response relationship between exposure level and enlargement of the mesial surface of the superior frontal gyrus, and this is bilateral. Now, why is this important, or is it important? The various um, cognitive and behavioral processes that are subserved by these regions um, are actually fairly important. Attention and receptive language, social cognition, reward emotion and inhibitory control, and executive function. All really important for development, learning, and academic success. A second finding, there were disruptive effects on cognition. Um, this without a, a slice to show you. Uh, there was a significant interaction of IQ with exposure. Among the low exposure kids, there's a normal positive association of IQ with local volumes. And this is what you would expect. But this association is disturbed and not present among the highly exposed children. A third finding, a disruption of normal sexual dimorphism. Most people do not think of chlorpyrifos as an endocrine disruptor. However, it might be. Um, children in the high group showed a loss of expected sex differences in the right parietal cortex and a reversal of normal sex differences in the right mesial prefrontal cortex. And this is um, according to Ted Slotkin, who does a lot of rodent work at Duke are consistent with the unsexing of neurobehavioral performance that he sees in animal models as a result of chlorpyrifos exposure. Results number four. There is an association with cortical thickness. There is reduced thickness of the dorsal, parietal, and frontal cortices in the high exposure group. This is a thinning of the cortex. Within the high exposure group, there is an inverse dose-response relationship of cortical thickness with chlorpyrifos exposure. These results are also clearly in the same direction. It's quite astonishing. So you can see the correlation of cortical thickness with exposure level, again, highlighting sort of a dose-response effect in children with high 
chlorpyrifos exposure. Remember, we had 20. This is the pilot study, so there are only 20 children highly exposed. And it's a fairly remarkable and consistent picture in these areas of the cortex. Now, to summarize the pilot findings, these anomalies suggest that the prenatal exposure, even at very low levels, which is standard, uh, very consistent with standard usage, was significantly associated with structural changes in the brain, including sex-specific effects. And these seem to persist into middle childhood, which may be related to longer-term neuropsychological problems. Now, this is the real study. Um, we had... Uh, continued to do um, neuroimaging. Uh, our total target sample is 350. We're up to about 330 right now. We did some analyses of some of the um, uh, kids early on, and I picked a subsample that we looked at movement disorder in, and then we'll show you some results of the perfusion um, modality. So these children, this is a part of the larger sample, 9 to 13 years of age, a little bit older. Um, we looked again at the, as with the previous um, results, the parent compound of chlorpyrifos in umbilical cord blood. This is all prenatal exposure. We have no postnatal exposures. And here we looked at an outcome which is considered a movement disorder, tremor. Um, we thought this was interesting to look at because we found the um, finger dexterity problem, and we're wondering how far the motor problems might extend. So what is tremor? Um, we assessed it by using a measure called the Archimedes spiral, uh, which is a freehand spiral drawn by kids, and it was rated by a neurologist with expertise in movement disorder. The prevalence overall um, from his own work is about 9% in this age group. Um, so the ratings range from zero to two. There's a cut point of one, which is the low amplitude oscillations are present in multiple places. This is clinically meaningful. And this results in four possible scores. You could have tremor in the dominant hand. You could have tremor in the non-dominant hand. You could have tremor in either hand, or you could have tremor in both hands. And this is what it looks like. I think it's very faint for you to actually see in this room. I probably, the slide isn't dark enough, but the D, which is the lower right-hand corner, is a very sketchy spiral. Um, it's got uh, low ampl amplitude oscillations in multiple places, um, and at some points, the oscillations are, are quite, um, quite obvious. The way the children do this test, by the way, is to do a practice. Uh, where they try to stay on the line, then we give them a trial where they're doing a, uh, a freehand, and then we actually do the real trial. So the results of this. Children in the high chlorpyrifos group um, show higher rates of clinic clinically meaningful tremor. Um, when we adjust the analyses, the, the findings hold. So um, the reason this is an important thing and very unexamined um, to date is because tremor is presumed to originate uh, at, at, to, at the subcortical level. So it's either a cerebellar or a caudate uh, phenomenon. Uh, tremor, I'll say a few more words about the implications of child tremor. Um, the rates of tremor in this group, just looking down at the red numbers that have highlighted, are pretty high. Um, these are the highly exposed kids, 39% uh, of the kids showing tremor in either hand, I think, is, is something that we should pay attention to. So in order to understand tremor, um, we are just now finishing what, uh, what we call the perfusion analyses, which are, not, uh, which are very different from the structural, the anatomical analyses. And um, we found that the, uh, we did have some important effects on the caudate. We found that the chlorpyrifos exposure was inversely associated with perfusion in the caudate. This is consistent with the tremor, which is seen in the highly exposed kids, since the dorsal portion of the caudate supports higher order motor and cognitive functions. So the chlorpyrifos exposure is positively associated with perfusion also in the posterior cingulate cortex.
This participates in functions that place a person in time and place, memory, introspection, and interceptive processes. And this is what this looks like. This is the only perfusion slice that I'll show you, um, showing the bilateral effects of chlorpyrifos on the correlation of cerebral um, blood flow in a subsample of kids uh, with all of the measures. We detected strong inverse associations um, of perfusion using arterial spin labeling with prenatal chlorpyrifos exposure in the dorsal aspect of the caudate nucleus, and this was bilateral. This indicates, yes, cerebral blood flow. Um, and this is uh, associated with proportionally reduced perfusion of the caudate. We also detected positive associations of prenatal exposure and perfusion measures in the posterior cingulate cortex. So this is our first finding. Um, we have not looked at the cerebellum yet. I'm not sure that the, um, the slices go low enough, but we may have that. Uh, the caudate is an important area of the brain, and um, I think the presence of tremor in these kids is worrisome. Um, don't forget the kids are young. Uh, these children were assessed uh, only at 11 to 12 years of age. The implications of tremor as uh, we age um, are profound, um, and I think it's important to recognize with some neurodegenerative diseases, and particularly the origins of Parkinson's, it would be important to follow these kids and figure out um, if we've got something going on that could be a very detrimental in, uh, in time. So let me say a few more things before we turn back to the public health implications here. Does the normal underlying variability in our community population result in distinct profiles? Yes, that we could see uh, when we did our factor analysis and our hierarchical clustering three unique subgroups appeared. Do these kids with high pesticide exposure cluster together to form a distinct phenotype? Yes. Would we consider this um, a signature profile? I'm not sure. Um, I think at this point um, it's characterized by poor fine motor dexterity, tremor, auditory attention deficits, very good impulse control, and no visual memory problems. Does this phenotype put kids at risk for potential clinical, emotional learning impairments? Yes, these kids were also higher on, uh, we used the, uh, uh, the test of learning, the children's memory scales. These kids had looked like the profile was positively associated with several learning deficits, which would put children at risk for academic problems, so maybe associated with slightly lower IQ than the other groups as well. Can these cognitive and behavioral deficits be mapped to alterations in brain regions? Well, there's a little bit of evidence. We're just starting. We have a lot of post-processing to do. The full a sample size of 350 um, brains is, is, is coming, it's taking us a while. We have the other modalities to look at. But there is some evidence and some reason to be concerned. Exposure-related alterations in volumes of certain cortical regions that subserve attention and executive function have been observed. Lower perfusion in the caudate may explain higher tremor among those exposed, and further study of other brain systems is underway to explore the links um, in long-term functional impairment and also to explore potential reversibility. So this is just sort of a snapshot um, of some of the findings that come from this particular uh, prospective study. What are the implications of this? I think that for many of you in the room and for those of us who work in the field of public health, uh, the research findings are terrific um, to look at and always very interesting academically. Um, but what do we do with it? Um, I've been asked a lot of questions today. Um, certainly the postdocs, people are interested in public policy. And how do you get this information out? Uh, and what is the story? 
For many of you, you may be familiar with the regulatory story for lead and tobacco. They're well-known stories, and some would say for lead, it's been a public health success. I think I would stop just short of saying that because as the lead levels have dropped, um, sadly, the proportion of kids with toxic exposures all come from certain segments of society. So in New York City, um, they're literally all of the reports of toxic exposure to lead um, are in low-income minority groups. So we've kind of created, we're not done, we've created a disproportionate sort of environmental injustice, although we've done a good thing dropping lead levels and increasing safety standards. So this is the kind of thing you have to balance. Um, I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't drop the lead levels. I'm saying that then you have another problem where it's a, a very disproportionate distribution of exposure. This is exactly what's happening with pesticides right now. Uh, I think this is very important because um, the chlorpyrifos itself, uh, don't forget, is still permitted. So this is kind of the beginning of the story. EPA did a great thing in 2000, 2001 by phasing out um, chlorpyrifos and diazinon, OP pesticides, um, for all indoor residential use. Uh, agricultural use was still permitted, uh, but there are replacement pesticides um, that have been introduced or been, are now being used. They include the pyrethroids, which some people here are studying, um, carbamates, and um, I would suggest that these uh, chemicals are not really very well vetted. The ban itself has been remarkable. This is a sort of an accidental slide. Because the ban took place right in the middle of our study, we were still recruiting moms, we were still getting levels of chlorpyrifos in cord blood. And if you look at the, the span of time between 1999 down to 2006, and you can see the colored boxes in the graphs, the chlorpyrifos levels plummeted by year, which is complete evidence that the EPA ban was effective. I don't know if you often see this, um, I know we'd like to think that when we ban stuff, um, it really does work. Uh, it did work. Uh, so the moms that we were recruiting at the end of the recruitment period in 2006 had negligible, non-detectable levels of chlorpyrifos. The story continues. Um, in 2007, 2008, um, Dow Agrochemical is the manufacturer of Durspan, which was the trade name for chlorpyrifos, which is what you could buy in the hardware store to spray in your homes. Um, they wrote a lot of rebuttal and commentaries, um, particularly as the published work started to gain momentum. In 2008, um, the Natural Resources Defense Council petitioned EPA to ban chlorpyrifos for all uses and prepared a lawsuit. In 2008, Dow Agrochemical petitioned EPA to really relax restrictions of chlorpyrifos uh, for agricultural purposes. And then um, a process began of re-risk assessment. Uh, EPA prepared a report for the scientific advisory panel and voted to accept our evidence um, that uh, we should leave intact the standards. Of course, we would have liked the standards to be further tightened, but at least they paid attention not just to the animal evidence, but to the epidemiologic evidence. So during the last couple of years, EPA has continued to gather evidence, and there are many here, I suppose, who know a great deal more about the governmental process than I do. Um, but at this point, uh, when a risk assessment is conducted, uh, EPA's job is to collect the evidence. Um, that is followed by uh, typically a, um, a public commentary period. Information gets added to the docket, gets posted, uh, and people weigh in on, on what's going on. At this point, um, the most recent risk assessment, which came out at the beginning, beginning of December, late uh, November, did not appreciably tighten um, the standards. It looked like it in the beginning, but I think it, it really doesn't. 
So a number of academic institutions, advocacy groups, um, farm population groups have been adding information and trying to um, observe the public commentary period and suggest that EPA um, move further. I think that this is an important issue right now. The, the question about how prevalent are some of these exposures is, is very serious. Um, these, are, these are products that are being used um, in particularly um, agricultural communities in the United States. You folks live in California and um, grow wonderful fruits and vegetables and nuts and whatever, um, and it is used highly. The applicators um, are typically um, low, it's a not a high paid job, low income folks perhaps. The communities themselves, the farm communities are inhabited by lots of migrant workers and their families. So the people at the front line are really the least able in a way to fight uh, and to say that this is a bad chemical and it has potential um, you know, adverse consequences for, for their children. So I think that the, the weight of the scientific evidence is very important. I think the work of the advocacy groups is very important. I think we all know what we're working toward. Uh, and I just want to say that in New York City, where we have families um, with really neat kids who've been participating in this work for some of them as long as 15 years, um, I think the families themselves recognize the importance of contributing. Yeah, they get reimbursed for coming in, but it isn't, it isn't very much. They're giving time and they're giving um, their energy and we really appreciate it. This study, uh, I can't even begin to name uh, the many people who've contributed. We have many research workers and field workers who've been with us from the very beginning, from 1997, 1998, and investigators we've added along the way as we've added additional measures um, it, particularly the neurodevelopmental measures. So I just wanted to say and acknowledge thanks to um, all of these folks. Uh, in particular, I want to acknowledge um, Brad Peterson, who is the um, neuroscientist now at USC, left Columbia about a year ago, who's responsible for the neuroimaging findings and will continue. We probably have another year's worth of work uh, we'll be getting out another four papers in the next six months, and most of these will be the other modalities that we've been working on all this time. I just want, for clarification, the, the exposure was in the cord blood, so it was a one-time uh, exposure to chlorpyrifos. Did you all look for anything else? other than that one-time exposure? It was a one-time assessment. The assessment. exposure could have occurred any time during the prenatal right. period. So, but that, that, that was the one marker that you That's used? That's correct, okay. yeah. And yes, there were many other things because we have blood and biomarkers right. of other metals and pesticides. Um, many other things that various other investigators have been looking at over time that I have not acknowledged or, or talked about today. But, yeah, definitely. Really nice talk. Thank you. So kind of a follow-up question. You know, the, the easy comment or the criticism that one always has in the back of your mind, the correlation doesn't prove anything. It's not causation. So a one-time measurement of the cord blood, was there any, during the rest of the life of the kids that were assessed, did you measure their blood? Was there anything that was correlated with that in the future because their family tends to use a lot of pesticides or whatever. Yeah. And, and sort of a related question, is there anything else that can cause that um, indicator that was in the cord blood? Any other common urban chemicals that would cause the body to produce that indicator? So to answer the second part first, um, we had a, a, a person working at CDC labs who actually developed the assay, the blood assay for chlorpyrifos. Um, it is very different from looking at a urinary metabolite, um, which is sort of, in a way, a more distal um, biomarker. 
um, there is nothing else that could cause chlorpyrifos in the blood except chlorpyrifos. So that we're quite certain about. Um, it is the parent compound that's being measured. The first part of your question, no, we do not have follow-up um, assessments uh, of chlorpyrifos levels in the kid's blood uh, for a variety of reasons. I would say that the prenatal exposure period and the early postnatal period is certainly when the developing brain is most vulnerable. Um, so I'm not sure that that worries me terribly. On the other hand, there are occupational exposures um, to people who are actually applicators of pesticides, um, which are certainly happening in you know, adulthood to people uh, in other parts of the country. I, I'm, I'm not saying that that's not dangerous. I think that's incredibly risky because they're getting dermal and oh, they're getting inhalation and dermal. And I think for those folks, you have real high risk of toxicity. Um, but no, we know nothing else about these children's chlorpyrifos level exposure except they are inner city kids and the levels have dropped tremendously. We know a lot about intervening factors. In other words, we know a lot about other things in their lives. We've been into their homes. We can look at um, potential confounding conditions that could explain the, um, the odd neuropsych profile. Have I ever seen anything else that, that was related to a neuropsych profile that looks like that? No. It's a little unusual. Um, I don't know that it's a terrible profile, but it's unusual. So we may, it may, in, maybe the sort of tip of, give us some clues about what's actually happened in the brain. Very nice talk, thank you. So I have two questions that are related to the threshold effects that you were talking about. To the? Threshold effects, that there is no dose that does not cause an effect. Right. And also to the acute and chronic, how would you treat the neurodevelopmental effects um, resulting from an acute or chronic exposure? So um, in, in, your, in your MRI measurements, you're noticing that any, um, any, the, the effect starts right away at the, at the, lowest, expo at the lowest concentrations me measured in the blood. Mm -hmm. Who, can you speculate on the mechanism? How, how is this possible? Um, well, we know that it's, you know, something's going on that's affecting either early on um, at the cellular level. So whether it's happening through the processes of cell migration, cell differentiation, um, the neural circuitry is being disturbed in some way. No, I can't speculate any further on mechanism. Actually, um, Ted Slotkin, who's done a lot more mechanistic work in the animal literature, I think has a sort of a, a better grip on that, but we have to determine whether or not that's how it's happening in people. And we don't have information about that yet. I'm hoping, actually, that the other modalities um, will be informative. We don't, uh, we have no other way of getting at the brain other than the scanning, um, if that answers your question. So for us that we do risk assessment, um, if, if there is no threshold, then we would, we would we cannot use um, the typical margin of exposure type of um, as estimating the risk. We would, as we would assume a linear approach, which is only been used for cancer. So this, is, this would be difficult to use the information from the epidemiological studies. But then the second question is... Um, but if you have a continuous measure of exposure, you can calculate, you can estimate a dose-response effect, yes? Is that what you're saying? Are you talking about the problems with looking at a relative risk? Yes. Versus looking... Yeah. We're not looking at a relative risk. We were looking at continuous levels. In some cases, we have a group of kids that have high exposure the most highly exposed children, the upper quartile, but we also have dose response effects. So we're trying to, even though the gentleman who mentioned the, caus the causality issue is always a problem in observational studies, 
Dose response effects are another piece of information that help to establish causality in addition to corroboration across studies. All right, so the second question is, how would you, um, would the neurodevelopmental effects be considered as a result of chronic or um, more of a single or of acute exposure? I have no way of actually knowing that because if we look at cord blood, it is a, um, a measure of exposure relating to the previous period, which is part of the fetal period. Our experience has been in, in interviewing the women and talking with people about their usage of pesticides that people rarely used a pesticide once. Um, they tended to do it regularly because the cockroaches didn't go away. In fact, there, there is much uh, interest in the subject in this area. I was at a hearing of a mosquito control district that was spraying from airplanes. About, I think it's talking about phosphates. I'm not quite sure this is the it same thing. It might have been malathion. My malathion, and anyway, it was a no. big. It was a big uh, pro problem about that. But I was thinking, this seems like a great experiment you have. But maybe it would be a good idea to repeat it again, uh, using different subjects in an agricultural area, because people can Dow, like Dow Chemical might say, "Look, this is New York City's not very agricultural." So, so it so. is. The Berkeley group is doing it, and they're continuing to follow their cohort and their. Their um, population is the, really the, the migrant farm workers in the okay. Salinas Valley. But your point is well taken. Um, and it has been suggested actually today um, that maybe we um, consider some of the um, South and Central American countries where there is an enormous application of chlorpyrifos and go down and take a look at those children. There was a I don't know if we talked about this report that just came out in February, the state um, California Department of Public Health in combination with California Department of Pesticide Regulation, California Air Resources Board, and a few other state agencies. Um, they mapped uh, all the schools in, Cal in California against the um, agricultural applications of pesticides, including chlorpyrifos and many others. Um, it's an astounding proportion, and I can't remember the exact number, but it's a really an astounding proportion um, of children in California who spend their school days uh, within a quarter mile of these applications, and some of them are right butting up against the agricultural fields uh, when they're out on the playground. And chlorpyrifos, we heard, is banned from f for residential use, uh, and yet and in they're in schools. It's banned. It from bans schools. use in the school, yes. but there they are out on the playgrounds um, being exposed. And those are almost, most of those schools are highly prevalent uh, population wise. Uh, the Hispanics are often 95% of, of the children in, in those schools because they, they're in the rural, you know, parts of California, Central Valley. Um, m schools have mostly moved out of the inner city to the outskirts because of you know, real estate prices and how, how you know, our, our city planning has, you know, the school districts were out of money, no, t you know, t money for schools was going down, and so they're, they're mostly cited in these areas, these high-risk areas, or they're next to, right next to freeways. Great talk, thank you, Virginia. I'm very interested in individual differences in how people metabolize uh, clofiros. Is there, has anybody looked at that, allelic differences in terms of metabolism of this uh, You know, I don't, I don't know. Um, certainly, um, both the Eskenazi group and uh, the original Stephanie Engels group uh, looked at the urinary metabolites where you do have mm -hmm. other issues in terms of getting um, you know, a good estimate concentration. But I don't know, and we haven't looked at that. It's something to think about, particularly if you're gonna look at other genetically vulnerable populations. <laughs> I think it's extremely important. Um, the, both of the, the California group and the Sinai group looked at um, some genetics and looked at PON1 in particular figured, I believe the Berkowitz paper um, showed um, bigger deficits on head circumference among um, children with that particular profile. Uh, it's actually, we have the data, 
and could go back and look at that now. We just haven't done it yet, but it's a great suggestion. Thank you very much <coughs> for your interesting data. Excuse me. When I come in this room, the ventilation system causes me to lose my voice. So. Um, and I must say I'm a little concerned since I have two grandchildren growing up in Harlem in New York who are still quite young. And I hope uh, my family's selective about what they take from the shelves of Dwayne Reed to it's, it's deal off with the this shelves. problem. It's completely off the shelves. We did a survey going into hardware stores, supermarkets, and bodegas. You cannot buy it. But I, ju I, I mean other types of treatments that are untested. And uh, I worked on a study in Hawaii in the late 1980s when there was heptachloric contamination of the milk supply in Hawaii. And we were able to evaluate newborns as well, <coughs> excuse me, as developmental outcomes. And I wondered, <coughs> the question is, were you able to assess head circumference at birth, excuse me, as well as length in addition to uh, low birth weight? This we is did. just getting worse. We like did. Frog um, that's throat. okay. I'll talk. We did, um, and actually, um, of interest, and um, I did not bring that slide. There was an increase in uh, proportion of small size for gestational age. So, along with uh, slightly reduced head circumference, and this probably won't surprise a lot of you, there was some evidence of growth restriction. Growth restriction is not a good thing. Um, in some ways, I'd rather be preterm. Uh, not too preterm, but growth restriction indicates a uh, pathological process. So um, there were uh, actually uh, increased odds of being formally SGA, which is, I think, uh, below the 10th percentile in terms of size for gestational age. And also, it, were you able to do any behavioral measures such as the Braselton? neonatal behavioral assessment. We didn't do the Braselton. Um, however, Stephanie Angle's group did. And I believe that in the early paper um, out of the, maybe the Bouchard group, have written about um, some sort of deficits in neonatal reflexes. And I believe they did it via the newborn assessment scale. Uh, that may be the Marx paper. I think that's the first author. So it was just the neonatal assessment after um, OP pesticide exposure, which includes actually chlorpyrifos and some of the other OP pesticides. But yes, people have looked at that and found problems with reflexes. So you were asked about mechanism, and you mentioned a couple possibilities, but wisely said can't speculate, but you did, you did cite a Slotkin 2004 paper. The reason I'm asking is because if anybody in the room can say this more precisely than me, please correct me, but in the new EPA risk assessment, my understanding from reading it pretty quickly was they said, we're not going to consider some of this developmental data. It's, it's out there. It looks like it might mean something, but because nobody can tell us what the mechanism is, we're not going to take it into account. Is that a correct summation? And if so, why don't they like the uh, Slotkin paper? I think that is correct. I don't know why they don't. They did use Slotkin's papers are, are have been well used by EPA over time. Um, so I don't really know the answer to that question. Does anyone else know? I mean, they do cite the animal literature, but it is animal. So even though it's, uh, it's, 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 it's tantalizing, they may suggest that the, the levels are very different for human populations. I think that Dale Haddis's work may be the more, um, the toxicokinetic work may be more informative. And he has a new paper coming out. Uh, it may already be out. So it's H-A-T-T-I-S, and he looked at our findings and uh, confirmed it with his modeling, uh, which is beyond my comprehension. It looks like physics to me, it, but it's, it's, quite, it's quite convincing if you want to take a look at that. It's not really mechanism, but it's, what would you call it, David? It's not really mechanism. Simulation. 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 
Does this involve, I haven't read the Slotkin paper, does it involve any mitochondrial mechanism? And do you ever see any? I actually have not. Um, does anybody know? Do you ever see any obvious white matter disease in the brain that? Does he? Yeah, or you in any of these MRIs that you've done, obvious white matter disease or, um, I mean, you've done a lot of neuroimaging and. Um, yeah, but you, you know the assumption is that it derives from something underneath. If you're if you're looking at the deformations, and uh, I uh -huh. don't have any better evidence yet. And are, you guys are looking at DTI. I can't remember whether you, yeah. It's done. Yeah. Uh, the question is, can we get that out quickly? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Virginia. That was a great talk. But I'm actually going to respond to Rondi. <laughs> Oh, good. <laughs> so, so, hi, Rondi. Um, basically, there's been a lot of work in the animal side on the preclinical models looking at oxidative stress and mitochondrial dysfunction. There's no evidence in the developmental literature that chlorpyrifos causes oxidative stress or, or interferes with mitochondrial function. Very little to no evidence that there's any effect on myelin in the developing brain of animals. In terms of. Correct. Um, so the major mechanisms that have been put forth to explain the developmental neurotoxicity of chlorpyrifos include changes in, in um, morphological development of neurons, particularly changes in axon outgrowth because acetylcholinesterase is a morphogen and uh, actually work from my lab has shown that in both uh, cell culture and whole animals and zebrafish, you inhibit, chlorpyrifos specifically inhibits axon outgrowth and then independent of any effects on acetylcholinesterase, neuroinflammation, or oxidative stress. So that is the, the mechanism the EPA is now espousing. Um, uh, and it's because the low levels that we've used are much lower than even Slotkin's. Yeah. And so the other issue um, that was brought up is, is the oxidative stress. You do see this in occupational exposures. So there's actually human and animal data to suggest that in occupational exposures in an adult animal, there is oxidative stress in the brain. And we actually have data we're putting together right now showing that antioxidant treatment prevents the behavioral deficits following an occupational exposure in an animal model. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with a promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.